Cool. So thank you all uh, very much for um, joining the Magnet Seminars. Um, we've had quite a successful run and today we've got another uh, popular session. So it's really good that we're getting uh, a lot of support for these. So thank you all very much for, for coming. Um, just a brief reminder for the formats of the seminars. Our talks are about 25 minutes or so. So could you please keep your microphones muted uh, during the presentation so as not to uh, disturb the, the presenter. Um, after the, the presentation, we'll have time for a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and answer session. Uh, if you don't want to unmute and ask an oral question, we can um, read out any questions that are sent to the text and either myself or Anita or one of the other uh, co-hosts will read out the question for you. Um, and you know we've all got life going on in the background, so as always, if you have to go halfway through, please uh, just go, don't worry about it. Um, and at the end of the seminars, we will have um, a chance to have a bit of a social, a bit of a catch up with everybody, um, as to make sure everyone's all doing good and, and a bit of a friendly chit chat. Um, but that part of the uh, seminar will not be uh, recorded. Uh, and so without further ado, I will uh, hand over to uh, Yael Engbers, who is, who is a PhD student in our lab in Liverpool. And she will be talking about anomalous field behavior in the South Atlantic over multi-million year timescales. So I'll pass over to you, Yael. Yes, thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen then. Can people see my screen right now? Yep, so you've got your um, PowerPoint window. Which is right in there. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about the recurrence of the magnetic field anomalies in the South Atlantic on a multi-million year time scale. Uh, for this research, we performed a paleomagnetic study at St. Helena, uh, which we just uh, published in our paper in PNAS. Um, the St. <laughs> Helena is a star in this image. Wait, let me just switch to a laser pointer. Everybody can see it. Um, so in this image of the field intensity, uh, in, from 2015 from IGRF, you can see the blue star uh, being St. Helena in the middle of the South Atlantic anomaly. And this talk is basically a short overview of the information that is given in our paper. Um, and yeah, we hope you'll read it afterwards. <laughs> so the current field, uh, the current magnetic field is not a perfect dipole. And the weakest part of being the South Atlantic anomaly is a popular topic of discussion. At St. Helena, the field is also weaker than expected. It's about 29.1 uh, microtesla, where if there was a geocentric actual dipole field, we would expect the field to be 33.8 microtesla. But actually at this island, the directional anomaly is even larger with an uh, inclination of minus 57 degrees, where we would expect about minus 30 degrees if there was a gas field. Um, so to show this directional anomaly, we created this plot uh, showing a contour map of angular deviation of the present day virtual geomagnetic, geomagnetic poles to the geographic pole. Um, and where you see dark blue uh, areas is where there's hardly any angular deviation or zero angular deviation. And then where the colors get lighter or to yellow and orange, there is a large angular deviation between the virtual geomagnetic pole and the geographic pole. Uh, and especially the South Atlantic anomaly is shown here where there's a deviation over 20 degrees where St. Helena is right in the center of that. So why is the South Atlantic anomaly such a popular topic uh, currently and why is it important? Well, obviously our magnetic field protects us uh, against solar winds. And where the South Atlantic anomaly is, there's less protection, which is why our satellites and International Space Station actually get damaged. And this is a reason why NASA has been very interested in tracking the current behavior in the South Atlantic. 
Uh, for us two physicists, it's more important to talk about the features of the magnetic field and how they are connected to lowermost mantle features. Uh, for instance, uh, John Torduno and others presented this paper in 2015 um, where they suggested that the edge of the large low shear velocity province uh, coincides with this uh, reverse flux patch on the core mantle boundary uh, that possibly causes the South Atlantic anomalous features. Uh, here's a paper. Then there are scientists who suggest that the South Atlantic anomaly is a very recent feature and actually might be coinciding with the total drop of intensity of the field and therefore might be caused to believe that there's a reversal coming up. Uh, and people suggest that if the South Atlantic region has been anomalous for a long enough period of time, it actually uh, defies the idea that our field averages to a geocentric actual dipole. So many reasons uh, for scientists to publish, uh, so yeah, make many publications about the South Atlantic anomaly. Here's a couple of them from the last five years or so. And then now our paper can proudly be added to that list. Um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, all these studies that I mentioned in the previous slide, except for our own study, uh, the last 300,000 years, either with data or with models. But if you want to really make a suggestion about the time average field and its connection to the lowermost mantle features, we would like to discuss at least 10 million years time scales. And St. Helena comes in because the age uh, of the rocks from St. Helena vary from eight and a half to 11 and a half million years. Uh, another helpful guide for us is that the, two years ago, PSV10 uh, was published, this paper about a database for all the directional data from the past 10 million years which we use to compare our data to, um, which makes it possible to really comment on the field for the past 10 million years. Oh. Um, here uh, is a data distribution for that data set. So the red dots are all the paleo locations for sites in the PSV10 data set, um, which is plotted again on this contour map for the angular deviation that we showed before. As you can see, uh, the South Atlantic anomaly uh, region doesn't have any data points in PSV10. Um, there is Tristan da Cunha, an island in the South Atlantic that does have, so it's a green square here, that um, does have a paleomagnetic study uh, since then by Shaw and others from 2016, uh, which is not covered in PSV10. And then there's St. Helena, which is even more important because uh, Tristan da Cunha is only about 90,000 years old, where St. Helena comes in with a very long time scale. So we went there in uh, January 2018, Andy Began and I went on fieldwork to St. Helena, which is uh, this beautiful island about uh, 2,000 kilometers left of the west coast of Africa. Uh, it's about 122 square kilometers in surface. And the geology of St. Helena is quite straightforward. It consists of two shield volcanoes, um, one being uh, the older shield volcano uh, is exposed mainly in the northeast of the island, which you can see here on the geological map. So the red and orange is the older, is the exposure of the older uh, no northeast volcano. The younger volcano is exposed in three different shields uh, in these blue purple areas, where the uh, upper shield is here where we sampled uh, with the yellow squares, and then the main shield is in purple and the lower shield is here in turquoise. And the yellow uh, symbols are where we actually perform field work. And as you can see, we sampled all the different shields or times of eruption. So we sampled the oldest Northeast volcano here in the Banks Valley area, where we took 10 sites. And then the youngest, as I said, at Prosperous Bay, it's, uh, it's called. Then the main shield of the younger volcano was sampled here at Ladder Hill, which was a very, very large section. And we took 28 sites uh, from that section along a road cut. And then the lower shield of the younger volcano, we took at two different locations, Porches Gate and Sandy Bay, where both of these locations had a dike intrusion, uh, which we sampled to perform a baked contact test. We uh, sampled a lot in two weeks. We took over 50 sites and 362 samples. Each site uh, generally represented a cooling unit or a flow. 
and we sampled five samples minimum per cooling unit, usually between five and 10 samples per site. And uh, the flows varied in thickness from about 20 centimeters to 10 meters. Where possible due to exposure, uh, we sampled the top, the middle and the bottom of the flow. And it was usually very obvious to see where the flow began or ended. Here are a few photos from our fieldwork. Here in the top right photo, you see me sampling at uh, Banks Valley, so the oldest rocks of the island that we took. Um, as you can see, it's not the most comfortable sampling location. It was quite steep, uh, and we feared our lives a few times. Oh, that's exaggerated. But, uh, here in the bottom left, you can see the youngest material that we took with us, aside from the dike intrusion. So here's Prosperous Bay, and also one of the thicker flows. And then here in the bottom right photo, you see Andy drilling in uh, one of the dikes at Sandy Bay. So in the younger volcano, a dike intruded, which we sampled for a big contact test, which actually turned out to be a lot less straightforward than we imagined. Uh, and if I do have time at the end of the presentation, I'd throw a few slides about this intriguing uh, dike intrusion. So we demagnetized all of our samples either thermally or in an alternating field using a rapid 2G magnetometer or, oh, sorry, or a JR6 spinner. And our uh, results were very clear. All the directions were straight to the origin or if there was a larger overprint, like in this sample, uh, the characteristic remnant magnetization was still very clearly interpretable. So overall, our ma maximum angular deviations were very low. If they did exceed 14 degrees, we left them out of the results. Um, the mean directions per site were also very coherent. So we took uh, selection criteria of k over 50 and n equals over 5, and that left us with 34 sites. And then we had two positive big contact tests and a positive reversal test that also convinced us of the validity of our data. Here is a uh, summary equal area plot of all of our sites combined. And as you can see, we both have reversed and normal polarity in our sites. Um, you can see that there's many orange sites, which are from the ladder hill section that I mentioned before, it was a very, very large section in the main shield of the younger volcano. And you see uh, a lot of green sites that have normal polarity. They are from the Banks Valley section that was in the oldest volcano. And then you see that uh, blue sites actually have some transitional results. Uh, and this uh, section showed us uh, a reversal where this is the bottom flow and it goes to the transitional flows and the top flow actually has a normal reversal. Um, this is more obviously uh, clearly seen in this rough magnetic polarity stratigraphy that we created, where again, you see the oldest sites here all have a normal polarity from Banks Valley. Then the very large section in the main shield uh, called Ladder Hill have three reversals within that section. And then the youngest section, Prosperous Bay, shows a reversal in the actual results. And you can see that in our uh, timeline, we have we capture six different reversals, which is very reassuring of our data set spanning a long enough time, uh, timeline to, yeah say anything about secular variation. When we plot our virtual geomagnetic poles, as we do here, after normalizing the reverse data, um, we can yeah, see a few, notice a few things. One, the most important, being that the scatter of this data set is very, very high. So there's a lot of outliers, um, and yeah, the dispersion that we calculated is 21.9 degrees which is very high for the latitude of St. Helena. I'll come back to that later on. Uh, second thing is that even though there's a lot of outliers and the scatter is very high, the actual average of our data set isn't that far from uh, the geographic pole. So even though we see a lot of anomalous behavior, the actual average still gets close to a geocentric actual dipole, which is just reassuring for the paleomagnetic uh, community. So then we also plotted the pool for the current situation. So this is the present day field pool for St. Helena, which is noticeably uh, not much of an outlier compared to the rest of our data from St. Helena. So although in the current geomagnetic field, obviously the South Atlantic is uh, showing very anomalous behavior, 
over time, the pull for the current situation isn't an outlier for St. Helena compared to the rest of our data set. Um, so this 21.9 degrees PGP dispersion that we calculated um, is very high for our, for our latitudes, but obviously we want to make sure that it's not dependent on either the Fondama cutoff that we used or on the selection criteria that we used, like in our case, K being over 50 and N equal or over five. So in this uh, bar plot, I present the other scenarios that we tested and calculated the PGP dispersion for. In all scenarios, we use this equation to calculate the VGP dispersion, where we also accounted for the within site dispersion calculated from K. Um, in the bar plot, you can see green and blue bars, where the greens represent scenarios where uh, we use the Van Damme cutoff, and the blue bars represent scenarios where we use the 45 degree cutoff. And then the dark green is the scenario where uh, which is our preferred uh, selection criteria with k over 50 and n equals over equals or over five. And then on the right hand side of the plot, you can see all these diagonal stripes through the bars, which represents that we corrected for serial correlation. How we did that is that we calculated uh, over checks for flows that were right on top of each other, and we calculated or tested if they have a common true mean direction. If they pass that common true mean direction test, we uh, yeah, took them as being serial correlated, so uh, deposited in such a short amount of time that it captures only one moment of the field. So we combined those two results and then uh, took only one of the, like the combination into the calculation for the VGP dispersion. So what you notice if you look at this bar plot is that it does vary a little bit. Our result is right here at 21.9 degrees and it goes down to, the lowest VGP dispersion is 18.4 degrees, is uh, when we take K over 100. Um, and it goes up a little bit if we use a 45 degree cutoff, for instance. However, even though it goes down all the way to 18.4 degrees, when we compare it to the predicted value at um, our paleo latitude of 19.8 degrees south, it is still statistically high. So here is a triple line or pink line. Um, which represents the value for model G um, to calculate basically the expected VGP dispersion at this latitude. And model G is a relation between latitude and VGP dispersion. And in this case, we took the values for A and B uh, that are based on PSV10, uh, which are published by Dubravine et al. in 2019. And uh, I'll show you the model D. Uh, uh, what is it, relation in the next plot as well, where we took all the data from PSV10, so from the Cromwell paper, and um, divided them into latitudinal bins of 10 degrees, but separated for the Pacific Hemisphere in blue and the Atlantic Hemisphere in green. Um, and as you can see, it follows the trend very nicely, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and again, this trend is uh, model G. But then our St. Helena data point right here, the red star, is a massive outlier. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the main thing to take away from this plot really, is that just the VTP dispersion at St. Helena is, is substantially higher than expected at that latitude um, and expected from the model G calculations. Then another thing to notice is that the green bars, so the latitudinal bins from the Atlantic hemisphere plot above this model G prediction uh, a lot more often than the blue Pacific uh, bins. So 64% of the Atlantic bins plot above the model G trend, where only 27% of the Pacific bins plot above this trend. And another thing we noticed is that, uh, well, like I said before, the data actually follows this model G trend a lot better in the Northern hemisphere than in the Southern hemisphere but that might be due to these bins uh, being undersampled, which makes them underrepresent secular variation. When we look at our PSV10 uh, data set in localities instead of in latitudinal bins, St. Helena is still an outlier. It's again, this red star, um, but there are a few other outliers as well that don't follow the trend as nicely and that weren't visible in our previous plot. The main one that we want to focus on is this 
uh, outlier right here, which has a VGP dispersion of over 25 degrees. And at that latitude, again, that is very, very high. So we looked at that data point, which is um, the island of Martinique, which lies in the Caribbean. And it's right next to the island of Guadalupe. They're only about 100, 150 kilometers apart and similar in age as well, which makes us agree with the author of the paleomagnetic study that was performed at Martinique, who say that uh, the high secular variation or the high VTP dispersion in it from their data set is due to the low uh, amount of sites that they sampled and not due to a low, uh, to uh, anomalous behavior in that location. Because then obviously there would also be very high VGP dispersion at the island very close to it. And we can also show you the secular variation or VGP dispersion at Tristan de Cunha, which is the green square here, um, which is as expected higher than the trend uh, because it is in the South Atlantic. Um, however, it's a very young island and therefore also they didn't sample as long of a time span as we did. So that explains why it isn't as, as much of an outlier as St. Helena and possibly also because it's a bit further from the center of the South Atlantic economy. So um, I think we've established that there's a high secular variation in the area around St. Helena, but what causes this anomalous region to to have higher secular variation than elsewhere on the globe. Well, there's many different theories. And as we mentioned before, there's a theory from uh, John Tarduno and others that they suggest a large low shear velocity province and its steep edge causes a uh, reverse flux patch on the core mantle boundary, possibly causing the anomalous behavior. Uh, then there's other scientists who suggest that their existence of this eccentric gyre in the outer core, um, which reaches the core mantle boundary at the, right under the Atlantic is caused for higher secular variation. So uh, there's a paper by Aubert and others from 2013 who show uh, with numerical models what happens when they put in this eccentric gyre, which they say is eccentric due to the asymmetric growth of the inner core, which uh, then reaches the core mantle boundary right under the Atlantic. And in their models, this also causes higher secular variation for the entire Atlantic hemisphere, which would agree with our uh, conclusions that we saw earlier in the, in the PSV10 uh, relationship of VGP dispersion and latitude. But it wouldn't necessarily explain the extreme outlier that St. Helena is on that plot. So possibly it would be a combination of both of these scenarios. Um, but the conclusions that we actually can take out of our data set and out of our study is that VGP dispersion for St. Helena is uh, significantly high compared to the rest of the globe for the last 10 million years, which uh, does support the existence of an anomalous uh, geomagnetic variations and anomalous behavior in the South Atlantic for the past 12 million years, which is potentially linked to the interactions across the core mantle boundary. And the existence of this anomalous behavior for such a long time scale makes the chance of it being connected to the mantle all the higher. Then we can say that our mean pool, our average result, uh, actually isn't that far from the geographic pool, so it doesn't necessarily suggest that the time average field comps reflect a geocentric actual dipole. And the fact that we have a positive reversal test agrees with that as well. And the current pool for St. Helena, the current VGP, is actually not an outlier compared to the rest of the data from the past 12 million years at St. Helena. Um, thank you very much. That was my talk. Well, thank you very much, Ayal. That was a really good talk. I think we can all uh, show our virtual uh, appreciation with a virtual round of applause. Um, thank you very much. That was really good. Um, we can now open the, the floor to, to some questions, if anybody has some. And we go. I can see Lisa has uh, Lisa talks has raised her hand. Um, if you'd like to unmute, yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, very nice talk, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I, I just was curious about two things. One is that in the PSV10 data collection, mm -hmm. the they uh, or I should say we. Mm -hmm. 
selected for um, plate motion. And um, in, because over the last 10 million years, if you just restrict it to a couple million years, you don't have to worry about it. But uh, 10 million years, um, you do. And um, Africa, the African plate has been moving northward and it should be about a five degree um, correction for that from African plate motion. Um, that's one thing. So I was wondering if you corrected for that. And the second thing is that uh, Ron Shar, I'm sorry he didn't show up today. Uh, he he showed, we published a paper recently from the Golan Heights and uh, from, from the Levant. And he said, which shocked me, uh, that, and, but it's true. If you use tighter selection criteria, like your mat of 15 is, is very, very loose. We always use five. And um, he suggested that if you use an N of six and a kappa of 100, that the scatter in our uh, uh, Israeli data set um, went way down. And so we did the same thing in our reanalysis of the Antarctic data of Lawrence and found the same effect. Um, and uh, so I'm just curious how much uh, data scatter contributes to your VGP scatter. Um, okay, so first uh, first question is uh, about the, the movement of the plate, which we corrected for in the exact same way. Uh, we basically copied it from Plate 310 with the NNR Morval uh, model that we used. So it is indeed about six degrees even, I think, that St. Helena moved. Um, so the current latitude is about 12 degrees, and we looked at the latitude, which was then was about 19 degrees south. Okay. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is a yeah, very important point. Um, I didn't actually look at the maximum angular deviation average, for instance. I think ours are overall lower than, like a lot lower than 15 degrees. Um, so that would be interesting to see what happens, what is left if you kick out more. But I think it would have a very small effect, except that your N would then be a bit smaller if you would have to already small I mean you need a hundred but <laughs> yeah and then um, with the k value obviously we did look at the k over a hundred situation which brings it down to 18.4 degrees as I said in my talk mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, which is lower than 21 uh, for the for k over 50 but then yeah our n value is only 19 so mm -hmm. it's weighing the ideas, but I think the most important thing is that 18.4 degrees would still be statistically a lot higher than, than the expected value uh, that we see from the trend that PSV10 follows. And then I think if you would take our data set and only look at what happens with K over 100, you should reanalyze the PSV10 data set as well, because maybe the whole trend would then... Absolutely. I, I think so. I probably have to go back to all these heads and do them again. Exactly. And then, yeah, there's just the issue of not having enough yeah. uh, sites left and it being quite difficult to go back to St. Helena, especially current situation, uh, right. to gather more. But I think I am uh, definitely convinced that showing that with K over 100, the, the PPP dispersion is still statistically so much higher that there is something going on there uh, causing this high cyclic variation. Yeah, I think you're right. I think your instincts are correct. Thank you. I do think we should go back to all those islands. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say no. <laughs> do it it sounds like an exercise in keeping keeping ourselves in a job. You know, we, yeah. we, we prove this now, but we need to go back to get even more. <laughs> oh, very good idea. Um, so, uh, Kathy uh, Constable has a, a, a question. Uh, I invite you to come here. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I've got a, actually I've got two questions. Um, and my first question is actually about numbers of data and uh, whether you think we really have enough. If you look at the PSP 10 data set, uh, there's a sort of, there's an assumption that the 
temporal sampling across all these globally distributed sites is somehow equivalent. Um, but we don't really know that for the past 10 million years. And if you look in the, the five to 10 million year, older than five million year interval, you know, there's, a, there's 166 sites in PSV10. And then if you correct for serial correlation, there are actually less than 100. And so this is kind of a delicate issue, right? Because you're arguing that you can pick distinctions between Fernando de Naranja and other places. And that in some cases, you're arguing that small numbers of sites means you overestimate the dispersion. In other cases, there's an argument that it underestimates the dispersion and you can't have it both ways. <laughs> so the first question is, you know, are there, how many sites do we really need in order for you to be able to say this? And my second question, it, well, just get it out there well, so you, so you have a chance to forget it, <laughs> is if you look at the um, South Atlantic anomaly today, there's a significant low in, in field and strength. And so I'm wondering if you have any hope at all of looking at the paleo intensity and uh, using that to support the idea of perhaps low intensity to support the idea that there's a significant anomaly there. And by the way, it was a nice talk. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, the first question I find very, very hard, very difficult to answer um, because you're right, the data is mainly focused on even the last million year, not so much. Mm -hmm. and exactly specifically last five million years. Um, so I think we could have a very lengthy discussion with the entire community about what, what is enough data. And in the end, you do what you do with what you have. And I do think for St. Helena specifically, we have enough to show that, that it's high sector variation. Um, and even, I would say that we could make that you know, comparison to, to the rest of the globe with PSV10. But yeah, we have to keep in mind that PSV10 might be mainly actually PSV5 plus a few extra locations. Um, yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at the distribution for the older than five million years, it's, you know, like, yeah. I don't know, eight, eight or 10 from Spitsbergen, uh, less than 10 from France, uh, you know, for and on to couple of from Patagonia and then none of these are really large enough samples to get a statistically meaningful average. So you don't really know whether you've got the contrast or whether it could actually just be that PSV was overall very high at that time, for example. So, and that would be, uh, that would also be an interesting result. It would actually also be very interesting, yes. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't know where that boundary would be uh, exactly. But I mean, I guess we'll just have to find a lot more sampling locations that have samples of older than five million years in that, uh, yeah, in the south land, uh, south uh, southern hemisphere specifically would be nice. And then your second question is: Yes, we are uh, definitely working on paleo intensity data. However, uh, currently the last four or five months, nothing has happened. So uh, yeah, hopefully very soon I can get back to Liverpool and back to that. We have some results, but it's very limited so far. Um, and actually those are very buried as well so it's it's uh it's not yet good enough to uh, share with the world <laughs> yeah okay thank you hopefully i have time in the rest of my phd before uh yeah from um, the covid situation so thank you um do we have uh, any any other questions for yael oh we've got uh this might be a bit of a plant, but we've got a question from Andy Biggin. <laughs> Hi. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just weigh in on the, it's, it's a comment really, just um, we we're talking about how many samples you need. So I can, um, can't share my screen. So I'm looking at a plot now from a Monte Carlo analysis that uh, I published in a 2008 paper. And basically, yeah, this is about right that if you, that over hundred is ideal if you want to get to, um, you know, dispersions that, that are likely to be accurate to, to a couple of degrees. Uh, but anything to sort of 25 up, you should be down less than five degrees sort of out. So on this, on this level of discrepancy that we have the global data sets, I would say that we're kind of, we're, we're into getting into safe territory there, so. Yeah, I think you're in safe territory. The question is whether other people are. 
Uh, I would say below 25, yeah, and certainly below uh, 15, then you could be all over the place. And also to, to come back to, to what you said, um, Kathy, they can be both high and low. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it, there's, there's no bias, at least from this, for, from this simple analysis that I did, that they could be, for 10, for an N of 10, you can be, you know, easily up by, uh, uh, yeah, seven or eight degrees or down by the same amount. I think what we're really saying is we should reanalyze the PSV10 data set, but then instead of looking at localities with a minimum of nine, we should look at localities with a minimum of 15 to 20 yeah. cents. Let's see what's left. And then we need a, we need a Taffy 2.0 where we get actually what you need, which is 100. <laughs> and there's, that's a lot of work. So I'll see you years. Nice. Cool, excellent. Um, we have time for uh, another question before we come to a close. So I've got one last question. Um, that is, uh, did you sample everything that's available or could you actually go back and get more? Um, you, there is more available, but we definitely sampled the highest quality flows that are uh, there. Then, so for instance, Ladder Hill had like 50 sites. And we skipped the ones that looked uh, either, you know, low quality or, or very altered or something. And then there's different outcrops that are still uh, available, but like a two hour hike. So we didn't have the time. Right. And so we also don't know the quality because we never made it there. Uh, so okay. there is there is still opportunity. It's just a matter of whether it's worth it then, mm -hmm. considering yeah. how far that travel is. I would be up for it, but <laughs> yeah, right. Just, I, you just need to be paid to go there. <laughs> one lava flow in Yan Mayan. <laughs> I think uh, Anita has another. Uh, Anita has a quick question. I wrote it in the chat. Sorry, <laughs> I was wondering, yeah, what's the what's the uh, situation when you went there? I, I see you have a already nice uh, geological map. Um, I was wondering about dating constraints. Uh, there were already uh, some dating done, or did you do it? Oh. Um, so the dates that we use for our study have been uh, published by Han Yu et al. in 2014. So. That is the most recent, and that's the only argon-argon dating that has been done. Uh, but it's not the exact locations that we sampled. Some, some are, but most of them are from quite different locations. So we had to um, either interpolate like between the, this age that we knew that was younger and, and older. Um, and then we are currently busy with uh, another argon-argon study uh, in co uh, collaboration with uh, Scotland. Glasgow. Thanks. Cool, excellent. Thank you very much, Yael. Um, I would like to just ask everyone once again to give uh, Yael another uh, virtual round of applause for a very good uh, presentation and um, a very good uh, question session. Um, before we all um, come to a complete close, um, i just like to, to, to uh, remind everybody that um, uh, all of our Magnets uh, presentations are, are going up onto YouTube. It's a very long link there. Uh, I'll send out uh, a URL to the, um, to the mailing list. And I want to thank the Earthref and Magic team for, for hosting us um, and for um, setting up a system so that these presentations um, are citable uh, objects. Um, a reminder that we've got um, um, our schedule uh, for the next uh, few weeks. We've got most of it filled until the end of the year. Um, we may have a slot uh, available in December, but I think that given that AGU is looking up, looking to basically take up the entirety of, of December, um, we will probably not be hosting uh, a seminar uh, in December, um, but we'll be, we'll be back uh, properly in the new year. Um, but as always, um, feedback and criticisms are welcome, just drop us an email. And thank you all very much for uh, joining uh, Magnets today. Thank you.